All right, welcome everyone to the third actor problem solving session. Um, today we'll have a look at homotopies and um, isomorphisms and finite types again, which you already saw in the exercises, and then in the end, the uh, well ordering principle of the natural numbers. Um, I will share my screen. Um, all right, part one, homotopies. So, um, um, could you confirm again that you can hear me? Um, cause my, my avatar, okay, thanks. Um, all right, so, uh, homotopies. Um, well, Homotopies are pointwise equalities between functions, and you've seen that from set theory. And you can usually say, well, uh, in set theory, since a function is really just a subset um, of, of a product, then if a function agrees on all arguments, or if two functions agree on all, on all arguments, then they're equal. Um, but here, this is not really the case. Um, so we can define the type of all proofs that two functions are pointwise equal. Um, but in hot alone, it's not possible to prove that this implies in general that f and g are equal, that their identity type is inhabited. Um, but the statement that that's the case is called function ext extensionality, and it follows from univalence. So we need an axiom for that, or we can prove it in cubicle. Um, but here we don't, don't need that this implies uh, equality of f and g. Um, and so, um, the, the only thing we, we need really is that it defines a binary relation on the type of dependent functions from A to B. Um, and we want to prove that this relation is uh, reflexive and, uh, but that's not really surprising. Um, if, if we define this as pointwise equality, then uh, at every point we should get an equality. Um, and by path induction, that would just be a reflexivity. So let's see if actor can autofill this. Yes, it can. Um, okay. And in the next case, uh, we want to prove that it's symmetric. Um, here, ACTA can't autofill it, but that's okay. Uh, so we have already abstracted the homotopy H from F to G. Um, let's see if I can show you my context. Um, yeah, so here below you can see H is a homotopy from F to G. Um, and we have an X in the domain A. So we somehow need to invert this homotopy at X. Um, and the function which inverts paths is, is called sim for symmetry. Um, and let's define this and plug in H at X. So we've inverted our homotopy pointwise, and that gives us a pointwise equality. Um, all right, concatenation. Uh, here we have three functions, F, G, and H, and two homotopies, uh, H from F to G and K from G to H and also an element x of the domain and um well we want to we can concatenate paths and this is obviously what we need to do here so um the concatenation operation on paths in this library is called trans or transitivity of paths or qualities um and so we need to input the first path um h at x um, that's a path from uh, f of x to g of x. And then uh, we can, concat can concatenate this with k of, k of x, and that's a path from uh, g of x to h of x. And that gives us a pointless equality. Are there any questions regarding this part? Okay, that's not the case. In that case, we'll move on to isomorphisms. Um, isomorphisms are kind of important. They are what you would what you would classically see as isomorphisms, maybe in a complete category. Um, 
but they're not quite the same as equivalences. So soon, I believe tomorrow, um, we will finally introduce equivalences between types. And it's true that uh, every isomorphism gives an equivalence and every equivalence gives an isomorphism, but the type of isomorphisms and equivalences are not equivalent. Um, so the isomorphisms are, aren't behaved as well as equivalences. Uh, in any case, um, so uh, two types A and B are called isomorphic. If there is well, a bijection, an isomorphism function from A to B, um, and a proof that that's a bijection. Um, and well, what's a bijection in this case? A bijection consists of an inverse function and uh, proofs that if you compose the inverse with F, then that's homotopic to the identity. So pointwise equal uh, to doing nothing and also the other way around. Um, now this exercise asks us to define this um, using sigma types, sigma types, and that's also not so difficult. Um, we have sigma, so, so first of all, the isomorphism, isomorphism consists of the function f from a to b. Um, and the bijection is um, Did I use the wrong sigma? Yeah, that actually is. Ah, I need parentheses around the to yeah. Okay. Um, and the bijection, uh, that's, let's see if we can refine this uh, to, no, we cannot. Um, Okay, then we'll just type it out. So uh, an inverse, it's called inverse above, but for brevity, we call it G here. Um, and G consists of, uh, G is just a function from the codomain um, of F. So we could write B here to the domain of that. Um, and then, oh, someone's raising their hand, yes. All right. At, Thing. Uh, yes, so uh, what I was thinking is why do we use a codomain and domain function instead of just bringing the implicit argument into context and just say it's a function from B to A right, with bringing B and A into context before in the left hand side of the definition? Um, yeah, there isn't a, a concrete reason. Um, it's, it's really just a preference of style. Um, yeah, what, what he's suggesting is I could also write A and B here, and then I think B and A. Um, maybe maybe codomain and domain short makes it more clear that G really depends on F and uh, sort of belongs to F. Um, but yeah, both is fine. Um, okay, uh, and so we still need to and the beta and epsilon uh, unit and co-unit laws um, or impose them as axioms. And one would be that G composed with F is homotopic to the identity. And the second condition would be that F composed with G is homotopic to the identity. Ah, I need to load again. Now we have. Okay, uh, no questions so far. All right, uh, now we have a very simple exercise to prove that the types two and um, uh, Boolean, the Booleans are isomorphic. Let's uh, check out the definition of the Boolean. Um, well, the Booleans are also an inductive type with two constructors. Um, so, so they're not judgmentally equal, but they should be uh, isomorphic. Um, all right. Um, 
we have uh, some very obvious holes. Um, so the, the function is, is suggest, suggestively called f, that's the function from boot to two, and bijectivity, that's where the proof f is bijection below, is bijection. Um, and again, here the inverse should be g. Um, the eta should be given by the composition of g with f and epsilon, of course, with uh, by the composition of f with g. Um, all right. Um, so we have two choices here to construct such an isomorphism. We could send false um, to one and true to zero. Or we can send um, uh, false to zero and true to one. And uh, these choices aren't uh, homotopic. And so um, the type of isomorphisms from root to two is actually not a set. Uh, well, it's it's a set. It is a set, uh, but it's not a proposition. There's more than one way of doing this. Um, yeah. OK, but in this case, um, Stay consistent. We map parts to zero. I think that's more intuitive. Um, yeah, one and true to one. And then conversely, of course, we need to map uh, zero to parts, one to true. Um, and uh, by going round trip, this is definitionally equal to true. So um, you can order fill this to refer parts and refer two, and also order fill this to refer zero and refer one. And that type checks. All right. Um, finite types. Um, we have two definitions of the standard finite types as a type family over the natural numbers and as an inductive type. Um, so this is really the, the standard definition. It's inductive, and uh, we prefer to use this in proof assistance. Um, so uh, the first exercise asks us to prove the elimination principle. And the elimination principle assumes that we have a type family A um, over every finite type um, parameterized by n. And, um, and for the successor, we have a value at zero, and um, and we also have have sort of the function given over um, over this the successor um, map, and it asks us to combine those um, to a function from from all all of the finite types, uh, where, or every whole finite type, and. Um, Well, at zero, we have um, this A here. And uh, so, yeah, we have A and A zero, and we need an element of A zero. So let's put an A here. Um, and we need an element in A of successor of K. Let's see if I can increase the font size here as well. Um, and we haven't used this f yet, so let's use it. f um, f is a function which takes such a uh, finite type, an implicit n um, decay. So f is really the, the function of it over the successor here. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, I, I received a phone call. Um, and, and uh, then, of course, uh, our element k is an element of the finite types, which you can plug into such an f. Um, now, what is left? Um, we need to construct an element of a uh, of k. And um, well, here, we need to apply our recursive call. We have constructed this for the predecessors of k plus 1. Um, so let's use this a to k. And uh, that tricks. Um, so I think all of this isn't too surprising. Um, we also see uh, the other definition of the finite types as a recursive coproduct. Uh, here again, the notation is a bit different from the last exercise sheet. Uh, zero was called point, and successor was called i. 
um, but that's what it is here. Um, here we're also renaming our inclusions from the code product to zero prime and successor prime. And now we need to um, construct an isomorphism between the two types. And I really hope that they're isomorphic. The trivial holes here have already been filled. Um, and now notice here that in the cases for F and G, we don't even prove this for um, for for n, n equals zero, and that's uh, of course because the finite type with zero elements is empty, so the functions in between there are trivial. And Acta also knows that um, Acta also knows here that the homotopies are trivial for the round trips. All right, um, yeah. So we should map zero to zero prime. I think um, that's a good idea. And we should also map um, the successor of K um, to, to, well, to successor prime and successor prime takes some, take some arguments. Um, and that's really uh, F with its arguments. So F here has the N explicit. Um, maybe maybe that's not very consistent in the notation. Maybe we should leave the N here implicit. Um, so we need to plug it in and uh, then also the K because that's an argument here. Uh, so conversely, um, the point gets mapped to zero. Uh, so this is zero prime here. Um, and then the, the recursive one gets mapped to the successor. And the J, again, we need to have this nth tree function here and plug in the K. Um, of course, going round trip uh, for the base, base case, um, this is just judgmentally equal to going from zero to zero prime and back. Um, we have an induction hypothesis uh, for the inductive case on, on the round trip, and that's that just states that um, for the nth function and the uh, finite set with k elements, um, we can go round trip, and now we get, need to prove this uh, for the finite set with uh, n plus one elements. Um, And of course, uh, on, on, on the one hand side, I mean, if you if you add a hole here, um, you can see the goal. Um, and that's really what what uh, what is just typed out here. We plug in this and this. Um, add the banner back in here. Um, and now we have some uh, judgmental refinements. Um, so by definition of that. Um, by, by its recursive definition, that this is just reflexive, reflective one, judgmentally equal to a successor prime. That's really what judgmental equality is. Um, and then by definition of G, uh, these two are also judgmentally equal. And, um, and now we actually need to do something. Uh, we know that by assumption that K um is equal to gm at f and k that's our induction hypothesis um and we have a path here and of course we would like to apply a successor to our endpoints and that's what we do um we apply a successor to the induction hypothesis okay and the other way around should be no more difficult than this way because it's really a symmetric situation. Let's just fill this out. Like I can do most of the work for us. Um, and here again, um, here we need to apply the other constructor successor prime to the induction hypothesis in this case. All right. Uh, any questions so far? Or are you all waiting for the most interesting part of this exercise sheet? Certainly seems so. Um, less than or equals relation. We've seen this before. Um, here we use propositions at types. Zero less than or equal to y should be true for all y. So this is just one, uh, this one. Um, the successor should not be less or equal than zero. Um, so this should always be false. 
and uh, x plus one is less than or equal to x uh, y plus one if and only if uh, x is less than or equal to y. So this is really just s x uh, less than or equal to four subscript one to y. Yeah. Okay, uh, now in exercise seven, we're asked to um, given the type family P over the naturals, the lower bound N, uh, we should define what this means. What for N to be a lower bound, it's a natural number such that for all other naturals M, so that S for a pi type M, um, we have that um, P of M holds implies N is less than or equal to M. And we can translate this directly. Okay, now uh, a minimal element uh, of such a type family is really uh, just um, an element which which uh, is a lower bound, and that there is, uh, yeah. So so it, it consists of an element. Um, of the natural numbers. Um, such that P is actually true at that element. And um, it should be a lower bound. So there is no lower, yeah, it's the least, least element for which P is true. Um, there is no bound N. Um, <clears throat> and how many elements do we expect in, uh, do we expect it to be in the minimal element? Uh, type for any type family it should really just be one. They should all be equal. Um, but we actually need univalence to prove this. So, uh, but right now we don't we don't need uh, the fact that there is only one element here. We only use this as notation to make things clearer. Ah, yeah, of course. Uh, maybe zero. Maybe p isn't true at all. Uh, very good. Um, and of course, uh, we're also um, assuming that P or, or implicitly assuming that P is a proposition here because we're viewing this as um, uh, as 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 a propositional type family, but there's no restriction on P. P could be like an n-groupoid, it could be more complex. Um, and then we could have different proofs uh, that P of n holds. Um, and, and that would give us here a, sort of a disjoint union index by n, uh, and then we could have more elements. But if p, the n is a proposition for all n, then there should be at most one minimal element. Um, okay, well, by definition, everything is less than or equal to zero. Uh, that's just start. All right, the well ordering principle. Um, Let's recall uh, the definition of decidability. So a type is decidable if uh, the co-product of A and not A is, uh, well, if we have a proof of it, um, and a proof of the co-product is also a proof uh, which of the two is true. Um, and if we have um, what a predicate here, uh, X to type, uh, in our case, that's a P. Um, we call that a de decidable predicate if it is pointwise decidable. Um, so as a type family, every family over each uh, every term, every type over each element is decidable. Um, and the well ordering principle states that whenever we have such a type family and um, the uh, type family is decidable, then at every element, if we know that um, P of n is true at that element n, then we can find a minimal element um, for P, so a natural number n, such that uh, P of n holds, uh, but there is no smaller natural number such that P of m is true. Um, okay, and, and here, if we define it like that, we also already have to kind of deal with, um, well, design patterns in ACTA um, in, well, when doing informal homotopy type theory, it's not so important, but here we get to make um, P 
get to make some decisions because maybe we want to collect the decidable type families over the natural numbers, um, maybe in a regular type. So we would have the sigma type consisting of type families and proves that they're decidable. And maybe um, here we want to only have elements, uh, here we want to uncurry, so we only have, want to have elements that, um, uh, so sigma types of n with n, and then n uh, says that p of n is true. And then maybe that's a more concise formulation, but maybe if we prove something about the well-ordering principle afterwards, um, or we only want to use parts of the solution or actually apply it to something, um, then we need to do more unpacking, or maybe we need to reassociate and prove that reassociating is an equivalence. Um, and so if we, if we build some machinery on top of this, uh, and then we de decide to change our definition of the well-ordering principle, um, then that could also be complicated. Uh, and there are some 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 ways uh, of well, some frameworks for constructing um, composed types, composed sigma types, for example. But uh, none of them are uniformly applicable. Uh, well, they are uniformly applicable, but they're not applied uniformly. Everyone has their own standards. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons it's very difficult to translate from one proof system to another, um, from one library to another one, even. In any case, um, we have uh, we want to prove the well ordering principle, and we have two lemmas to do so, um, which are sort of considered superfluous, uh, superfluous, but um, well, we use them anyway. Maybe it's a bit clearer. Um, the first lemma is called is minimal element suck, and that's really the most important lemma. Um, so we always, in the following, we will always have a type family over the natural numbers, which is decidable. Um, we have a natural number m such that p of the successor of m is true in this case. Um, and we know that m is a lower bound for p of successor. So sometimes I will, I will call it p, p of successor of x uh, as a type family, p prime. Um, and well, now the question is, is M also a lower bound for P? Um, well, only if zero, uh, if P of zero is not true. If P of zero is not true and uh, M is a lower bound for P prime, then success of M is a lower bound for P. So we would expect this to be true. Um, and if we weren't given the three cases here, um, or well, uh, yeah, we're, we're given three cases here. And uh, one actually states that um, uh, in, in one case, M is just any number. Um, and now is lower bound, um, is lower bound is defined as this function, which uh, asks us to prove that for any number, if P holds at that number, then that number is uh, bigger than the argument. Um, so in, in our case, that number would be zero and P zero would be a proof uh, that P at zero is true. Uh, and that's of course a contradiction with our assumption that uh, P zero is not true. Um, and how can we use this contradiction? Well, um, we uh, have, can, can construct an element of the empty type and from that um, proof that um, zero is a lower bound. And uh, such a construction from the empty type is called uh, zero non-dependent elimination. Um, and the con contradiction uh, arises from the assumption like P zero, so P zero is not true. Uh, and that means P zero implies the empty type. Oh. Um, we don't need to eliminate zero here since the goal is zero. Um. Yeah, 
yeah okay yeah that's true um yeah um i find this more intuitive but yeah um all right uh, and in the other case we do induction on m um and if we induct on m and we assume that um p uh, of the success of zero is true um and then we need to show that for every successor and p over that successor of n um that's the least element uh, with, uh, well zero is the least element for that um and 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 that's trivial because um yeah p p at success of zero is just p at one and success of n can never be less than one um Okay, and in this case, uh, in the inductive case, uh, which actually isn't inductive, we get two choices. Um, so let's define a helper function where um, H proves that M less than or equal to N. Um, that's what we need to prove. And one way is to use the inductive uh, hypothesis, but um, yeah, you can you can see this in the solution. Another way is to just use the assumption that is um, yeah, I can actually autofill this that um, n with uh, the success of n is an, a law of our friend. Um, yeah, and 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 that's really really uh, the the crux of the proof. Um, it's that we can um shift this type family p to shift it by one and then make a case distinction on whether p of zero holds or not and uh, well ordering principle suck is a wrapper which we will use for convenience when proving the well ordering principle um and it says again that we have such a type family and decide of the predicate and um an element uh, of the natural numbers then um, uh, and and also a, a proof that uh, p at the successor of n, so that p prime of n is true. Um, and now we don't have the negation of p at zero, but we know that p at zero is decidable, which is uh, just as good. Um, then any minim minimal element of p prime can be transformed to a minimal element of p. Um, and so in the case, base case uh, where we assume that P of zero is true, then um, well, such a minimal element has to be zero because P of zero is true. Um, yeah, so let's refine this. The minimal element consists of the natural number zero um, and a proof that that's a minimal element. So here we need to prove P of zero, um, but that's just given by P zero, of course, uh, by our assumption here. Um, and uh, well, to prove that uh, this actually has the property, um, we have some lambda, which uh, doesn't actually depend on this because zero is trivially yeah, because this is always the same proof that um, in this case, one is less than or equal to any successor, or uh, zero is less than or equal to anything else. Yeah. Um, okay, and for uh, the inductive case, uh, well, uh, the, the other case where we assume the negation, um, we of course want to use is minimal element suck. Um, and there are again two solutions. Um, let's define a helper function again. It is we want to prove that is lower bound to M. Um, 
So we know uh, just again, just once again, uh, we know that p prime of n is true, uh, and we know that p zero is not true, and uh, so um, we have such a minimal element n of p prime, and we want to construct. Uh, yeah, and we want to construct that uh, prove that the successor of m is a minimal element for p. Um, we're not ah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, my happy function is only one component of this. Um, so of course, uh, the successor of M should be the minimal element for P, that's what we're proving. Uh, and the proof uh, that this actually makes P true is given by PM. Um, but now we still need to prove that it's minimal, and this is our helpful function where we get two choices. And uh, one is, of course, um, to use the function from above is minimal element sec, and then we plug in everything that we have, and then there's min um, negation of p0. Um, that's the case where we can use the above. Or alternatively, uh, so this really amounts to the same thing by by substitution is we have um, h prime is lower column p select with m prime and q uh, well let's not use n here let's use k here and prove this by induction on k um by induction on k so in zero, uh, we're in the same situation as well. Uh, we don't really need to eliminate, but we do it anyway. Um, and in the inductive case, we get to use, so here we're only passing this uh, proof that n is a minimum for p prime um, to our helper function, but we can also use it directly. Uh, it's min m. Thank you. And that's also fine. Um, okay. Use the previous two lemmas to prove the well ordering principle. Finally, I would say um, we have still the side type family. We have a proof that it's decidable. We have some natural number n, and we know that p of n is true. And we uh, want to find a minimal element for p. Uh, now, if, if it's natural number n, so we induct on n, then natural number n is zero, then um, zero should be the minimal element. Um, but we still need to prove this. So uh, the proof that uh, p at zero is true is obviously given by p. Fine. Um, and now the lower bound, we already satisfied. Yes, uh, yeah, H prime seems so much simpler. Yes, uh, um, that, is, that is true, it's, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, so if you, in this case, um, we, it's minimal element, so like really is the mathematical part, and this is a wrapper, uh, which we wrap again in this case. Um, of course, you can do it directly, uh, but then of course you get confronted with the choice of, um, plugging all this into the well-ordering principle itself, and then maybe have some where statements. Um, it's not always clear which one is, is better, um, but I agree in, in this case, maybe the H prime version is preferable. Um, okay, so we still have P, <clears throat> P of zero, and uh, that's trivially the uh, minimal element. An anonymous module. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I used to have this as an anonymous module um, when designing this exercise, <clears throat> and that's also why, um, for example, here we don't need the D. So P, D, M, and P, M, uh, or only the first two. Uh, it depends. I don't remember where parameters um, to all of this. Um, 
but uh, then you run into issues if you want to have the well ordering principle itself in your anonymous module, because um, um, as we will see here, uh, you need to call the well, uh, do the recursive call on the well ordering principle. Um, but with P prime with the successor family, and if P is a parameter of the anonymous module, then uh, I don't think it's possible to do that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, as I was saying, um, let's fill this out. Um, here we have our P prime. So let's see if we can find this. P, looks like X. Um, yeah, it would be nice to have some kind of auto formatting here. Um, okay, and the proof that uh, P prime is decidable um, is also D shifted by one. So D of something else. Um, now it asks us uh, to give the natural number uh, where the, the, what is going to be the minimal element, um, except for potentially zero. Um, and then it's just n by assumption and prove that p of n is to this p. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, the chat is still happy with this. Um, yeah, and there are many things for which you can use the well ordering principle. So, for example, in the last exercise session, um, we construct, well, we assumed we had a function which constructs for each number a prime number which is bigger to prove that there are infinitely many primes. Um, but to, to uh, construct the prime counting function, we also had to make the assumption that that's the least um, least prime number above n. And we can use the well ordering principle to turn any such infinitude of prime functions into the next prime function. Um, and the well ordering principle is also used to um, construct the uh, greatest common divisor. Um, I suggest if, if you want to have a look at this, I can show you. Um, Let's open the actor Unima library, which is great, great library, and look for um, DCV or greatest common divisor. Um, so there are many files, so this needs some time to load. Uh, the greatest common divisor is also defined uh, in Eckbert's book. Um, but here you have it formalized, and here somewhere there should be um, the well ordering principle and the GCD. Um, yeah, because we need least elements here. Um, but talking about all of this is, of course, uh, out of our bounds today. Um, so let's, let's switch back to this. Um, here we have a, still a small sanity check. Uh, I don't know if it's actually. That's spicy. A small sanity check that uh, the well ordering principle if p of zero is true actually returns zero. Um, and well, in the base case, that's trivially, trivially the case. And uh, in the inductive step for m, we're asked to use uh, this auxiliary function again. Um, and here again, it's possibly cleaner not to use the helper function at all, but do it all in cases here. Um, but either way, um, the process is the same. Uh, as for the well ordering principle, um, we uh, shift our type family because that's how it's defined. Um, um, the, um, zero yeah and, and uh, now we need to call our well ordering principle on the shifted family uh, to see if it computes shifted family okay, and this to be 
We know my screen is too small or the font size is too big. We choose shift R um, or decidability, decidability predicate um, by one and plug in the M and PM. Yeah. Um, okay, and now let's do the actual work. Um, we have done, we have our shifted type family. We know that in this case, uh, P0 is true. So we know also that the well ordering principle, because it's defined this way, returns zero judgmentally. Um, this is where it just left it at zero. And in the inductive case, uh, or in, in the other case, I keep saying inductive case, uh, P is not true. Um, yeah, the reference solution gives, gives uh, non-dependent elimination again. Um, because we have an assumption that P0 is not true, but we also have a proof Q0 uh, that P0 is true. Um, sorry, not P0. Um, yeah, P0, yeah, of course. Okay, uh, and that's already the exercise sheet. Let's look at the time. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. Are there any questions? Okay, it seems to not be the case so far. Um, I think I'll stop the recording here, but I'll stay for the well, next 10 more minutes to see if anything comes up. Um,